Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome to another edition of the Insurgents Podcast, and I have a exciting announcement. I have with me a new conversation partner, although he's not brand new because he did an interview with me on the 76th episode of the podcast. And of course, I am referring to Brian Russell. Brian is a professor at Asbury Seminary, and he is the author of the book, Realigning with God. Brian, welcome to the show. Oh no, it's so great to be here with you, uh, Frank. It's uh, it's a joy. Looking forward to serving the audience and letting them get to know me a little bit and contribute into this exciting work of getting the gospel, the kingdom's message out in a powerful way. So. Mm, praise the Lord. Well, I'm excited to launch into a series of conversations on the mentions of the kingdom of God in the gospels. And so we're going to pick up where we left off, and that is in the Gospel of Mark. And today's passage that we're going to look at is in Mark 4, verse 11. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside all things come in parables. Of course, this is a statement that Jesus made to his disciples in the context of what is often called the parable of the sower, which begins in Mark 4, verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow. I have a, a few things I want to share about this before we actually look at the, the parable itself in this phrase, the mystery of the kingdom of God. I'd like to talk about parables in general. Uh, in Hebrew and Aramaic, the word parable can be translated riddle. And it seems that the main reason why Jesus taught in parables is because his message was politically incorrect. <laughs> uh, it was subversive. He was talking about an alternative king himself. He was talking about an alternative civilization, a different kingdom than that of Caesar's or Herod's. And so he spoke in coded language. He spoke in these parables or these riddles. And this was actually the chief way in which he presented the gospel of the kingdom was through these parabolic statements and stories. I don't know about you, but when I was a young Christian in Sunday school, I was taught that parables were stories in order to make a truth easy to understand. Right, right, that's right. <laughs> but, but Jesus, in effect, is saying the opposite. <laughs> no, no, I think that's, that's so important. It's like, you know, even when the, the, the old cliche in Christian education was Jesus always taught in stories, so we should always teach in stories. And, and obviously, story is a great way to convey truth. I mean, some of your books do that, and obviously, the, you can always remember people's illustrations. Mm -hmm. But the, but the interesting thing is, is exactly, you said Jesus teaches in stories, which at surface level are obvious enough and they're great stories, but he's able to put deep coded truths in there that yes. then he has to unpack for the disciples, which, you know, we have here. Yeah. It's, uh, they're, they're coming to ask him, what are you talking about in parables? We don't, we don't get it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, just, just think of the statement itself to you, meaning his disciples, his close followers, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom. And we'll talk about the meaning of that a little bit later. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So, in effect, they weren't designed to present truth in an easy, simple manner. They were designed to veil the truth from the masses, or at least that's the effect they had. Everything the Lord did created division within the house of Israel between those who believed and those who rejected him and his parables. And so the parables seem to serve that function, to separate those who truly had open hearts, were receptive to his message, versus those who had hard hearts and rejected it. I think that the parabolic ministry of Jesus, which, by the way, you don't really see in Paul. Paul doesn't really tell stories that much. And same with Peter, you know, even in the book of Acts. It seems very unique to Jesus. And I think part of the reason for that was 
he was pacing himself concerning the time in which the kingdom message would be unveiled to all. But in the beginning, he was coding a lot of it so that, as the Isaiah passage says, <laughs> to the rest, they would remain in darkness. Yeah, and that, that's part of the hard teachings in this text. And I'm sure we're going to get do a little bit of a deeper dive into the Isaiah 6. It, it is interesting in, in Mark that, because sometimes you listen to a text like it, you're like, oh my gosh, does that mean Jesus didn't want people to get it, right? <laughs> right. Um, and, you, and, and, and some people would argue that, that this is, you know, kind of separating sheep from the goats and those sorts of things. But, uh, but obviously Jesus is coming to announce the kingdom uh, so there can be a great harvest. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, even here in, in, in Mark, in, in verse 10, it says, when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked. And the interesting about that is, so it's, um, he's talking to the, he calls the 12 back in chapter 3. Um, and he calls the people that he wanted. And mm-hmm. like, if you go back to 313, he went up the mountain. That's where all this has taken place. And they came to him. And then he appointed 12, whom he named apostles. So he has the 12, but there's these other folks that are still there. So it's almost like there's three layers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's people who aren't there. Those are the true outsiders. And then there's this group that's at least interested enough to come and hear Jesus. And there, then there's his disciples. And in Mark, it sort of sounds like it's framed out that there's these different layers of people uh, that are listening, which I think is really important because um, it's because uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the sower stuff. Part of the issue is this isn't like predicting, you know, like God decides who's going to be in, who's going to be out, and then that some poor souls just get to be bad soil and some get to mm-hmm. be fruitful soil. Mm-hmm. It's part about who's coming to Jesus. And then as, you know, and then once you've actually heard and understood the kingdom message, because these are persons now, they want to know what he means, right? So the, everybody yes. gets the parable and then there's a response and Jesus is interested in the persons who are responded, yes. uh, responding, and so that there's that's we want to pick up that that's an important dimension here about uh, that this is uh, even if the parables are hard to understand, the whole point of that is the people that want to understand they're going to get the opportunity, and I think that's um, that says a lot about Jesus. And there's real strong application for us in that statement, which we'll unpack in a little bit. I think to keep before us is this idea that the kingdom is a secret you know when he says it is given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of god or the secret of the kingdom of god i think there's a twofold meaning to that one is the kingdom itself is the secret Mm -hmm. the mystery is the kingdom right and so the kingdom was breaking into the earth through jesus himself and his ministry yet most of the people of israel who are around him didn't recognize it So here the kingdom of God is coming in the person of Christ. And yet to those who do not have eyes to see and ears to hear, they did not even register that. And the kingdom message was so subversive, so dangerous, and it ran contrary to what most of the people in Israel wanted and expected concerning what the kingdom was through the prophets and so forth. It was not going to come like they thought. So in effect, it would have made those wedded to power angry and furious if they heard the true message and it was as clear as a bell. It would also make the ordinary Israelites angry and furious because it did not come the way they expected. So he calls it the mystery, the mystery of the kingdom. I guess the other meaning too is that all of what Jesus taught about the kingdom of God contained mystery in it as well. So the kingdom was a mystery. But all that is related to the kingdom is mysterious as well. I just see a paradox here that, let me put it this way. We live in a day where people want everybody to be equal, to have the same privileges, the same rights, the same access. And in a sense, that's true. The kingdom message is available to every human being. But in another sense, it's not true in that Jesus separates those who are on the outside from those who are on the inside. That doesn't sound right to our modern society. You know, how can you have insiders and outsiders? But the fact of the matter is that Jesus himself made that separation based upon how people would hear his message. Mm-hmm. So if you if you jump down after the parable of the sower, listen to these words. Yeah. Verse 23 of Mark 4. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. 
with the same measure you use it will be measured to you and to you who hear more will be given for whosoever has to him more will be given but whosoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him we're also told in the parallel passage in matthew 13 which is the same incident and the same occasion that we read in mark but we have some added details he basically says that it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given so he draws this distinction brian between the insiders who are given the explanation of what the parables mean and that's exactly what jesus did after he presented the parable of the sower to the masses then he took his disciples aside and he explained to them exactly what it meant there was a demarcation all right now does that mean that the insiders were better people does that mean they were smarter does that mean that um, they were more privileged the answer is no but their hearts were different yeah that's the that's the critical piece and that's where the parable of the sower comes in you have these different types of soil and that sets the context mm -hmm. and and if you notice this just to say a couple quick things about that particular parable what's the sower do the sower does when we think of modern farming you know you, you plant things in nice little rows in this case you just got this person going out tossing seed <laughs> and all the seeds are the same that's important um, mm -hmm. to notice that it's um um all the seeds have the potential of actually uh, growing the sower and it's the word and so mm -hmm. that's critical all the soil gets the word and so there's no way to read this that people aren't getting a full opportunity to hear the problem ends up being is it's the condition of the soil itself right, um, that's right. and and the first soil really addresses exactly what you just talked about the condition of the heart you know that first soil falls on rocky ground where and then birds come and instantly are eating it up and so it doesn't even have a chance to take root mm -hmm. um, the text says satan immediately comes and takes away the word that's sown but essentially uh, what that really represents are people that are coming in who aren't open at all mm -hmm. and so they don't even it just it comes they receive it and you know when you hear something especially in the semitic language you get the idea to really hear something isn't just mean you heard it mm -hmm. but you actually take action on it too you know yes. so like if you ask me a question and i hear you but i don't actually answer it i haven't really heard you mm -hmm. right and so and so in a sense that's what's going on and then you know these other t the two other middle soils are more about persecution and also the danger of 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 wealth and the desire for other things so the whole thing's about the condition but that first one is why do a lot of people aren't are they unable to hear it's just simply because for whatever reason their circumstance they're not open and so you know when you talk about insider outsider at some level you know god isn't put in the line people are putting their own line yes. in a sense that's and, right and, and and the folks that again want to know what the parable means in mark's gospel they're coming and asking him Mm -hmm. The people that aren't, that's just the rocky soil. They, in one ear, out the other, gone. And, uh, and again, Jesus is speaking um, in terms that definitely split, but it's the key is to go back. And if you look at it carefully, uh, people are getting the opportunity. It's just the condition of the heart. And a God is inviting everyone but not everyone comes and that's uh one of the hard pieces about the message and as you know as you said the, this whole thing about the secret the mystery it's um hidden in the sense that it's you said paradoxical and it's uh, if you're looking for a person to come and overthrow the roman emperor and here's jesus <laughs> you're missing it because uh, the paradox of the the secret of the kingdom is as we're moving in there it's going to be the how is it possible that the ultimate answer to the world is god dies on a cross who wants to hear that right and so that ends up being this dividing line oh, yeah. especially a first century jew who would find the concept of the messiah who's supposed to bring the kingdom and renew israel and defeat pagan domination the messiah is going to be a suffering messiah who's actually going to be put to death by the pagans i mean that's so offensive <laughs> It's ridiculous. So that's part of the mystery as well. You mentioned about the foul bird coming and stealing away the seed. I think it's really interesting when you look at the parable of the sower from the standpoint of Matthew 13, because Matthew adds some details that, as I said before, are omitted in Mark. Uh, one of them is that the seed itself is the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. That's what's being yeah. sown. Yeah. So if I can read Matthew 13, this is Jesus' explanation. 
verse 19 when anyone hears the word of the kingdom boom that's the seed the gospel of the kingdom the message of the kingdom when anyone hears the message of the kingdom and does not understand it then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart interestingly enough matthew uses this word understand mm -hmm. so we have someone preaching the gospel of the kingdom and there are those who hear it, they hear it with their physical ears. They hear the message of the kingdom, but they do not understand it, all right? That's when the enemy comes and takes it away. So to me, the critical question then is, how can a person understand the gospel of the kingdom? We as Westerners think understanding is just merely intellectual, but in the Hebrew mindset, and when you look at the totality of the Old Testament, a willingness to obey and receive goes hand in hand with understanding. See, the Aristotelian mindset would say we have to understand first before we can act. But the Hebrew mindset reverses that. You have to be willing to act before you can understand. It reminds me of what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.7. Reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Or think about what I am saying, and the Lord will give you understanding. So it's vital that we understand, and this, is, this applies to every person listening to this. The critical response that we must have is an openness and a willingness to obey and submit to truth and that will enable us to understand just like you said they went to jesus and said hey i don't get it explain it to us right they took that step because there was a receptivity that was the precursor to understanding and i think when we put it in our own day first of all most people have not even heard the gospel of the kingdom and i'm talking about christian people talk about this at length <laughs> in this podcast those who heard it, there is a segment of people who just do not understand it, even though they heard it. Part of that could be that the person speaking it doesn't understand it well enough to articulate it clearly. But in the parable of the sower, the responsibility is not on the one who's throwing the seed. Right. The assumption there is that all the seed's good and it's <laughs> the clear seed's good. and it's compelling and all the exactly. sower does is so. Exactly. So that puts the onus on the person hearing. And just like... James said in his letter, be doers of the word, receive the word yeah. with a humble, open, receptive heart, and then it will bear fruit. Don't just be hearers of it. I have come across in my own experience since I've been proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom that there are people who hear it, but they don't understand it. But part of the reason why they don't understand it is because there's not that receptivity to follow it. We, we are submerged with so much information, Brian, that the gospel of the kingdom can be viewed as just another thing. Okay, let me go ahead and, and read this article. Let me go ahead and listen to this message. And then now I'm going to move on to something else. Those are the people that really don't understand it. The people who really understand it and really get it and it bears fruit, they continue to receive this message because it's it's not just one simple message. I mean, there's a lot to it. You know what I mean? And I've talked about the drip drip effect. They continue to be exposed to it over and over again. They ask questions. They ask the Lord questions. What does this mean? How do I apply this? There is an intention to apply the message, to receive the message, to hear more about the message. And that's why we have so many resources proclaiming it in so many different ways. That's why we have this podcast. Yeah, I mean, you said something. I think the key word is it's intention. I can imagine someone's listening here that's a sensitive person. I know when I was growing up, I was always like, oh, my gosh, what if I don't get it? And uh, and the good news here is, I mean, it's the, this whole parable of the sower thing. It's inviting us. It's, it's an encouraging thing, number one. So, like, if we're sowing the gospel of the kingdom, it's an encouragement that there are people that are going to fully respond to it, and it's going to be a bountiful harvest out of those. Yes. So there's an encouragement piece. And so we want everybody to be encouraged uh, that the, the, the gospel of the kingdom is powerful and it can, and we want to be good soil. And then the other thing we want to do um, is 
set the intention that, you know, I want to be good soil. I want to, I want to mm-hmm. come to Jesus because, you know, part of the thing is, this says something really cool about Jesus. Jesus wants people to understand, and the gospel of the kingdom is about being radically related to a person, Jesus, who will teach us. Mm-hmm. So what we have to do, and to me this is the application in my own life, is we have to recognize that it's our job to test the soil in our own hearts. That's the one thing that we can do because uh, we can go through seasons. I mean, we can move past understanding and open ourselves up, but then you know, these other, these other two soils about being choked out by uh, persecution. And sometimes when it's, it's tough and you know, we've, there's different periods, there's Christians all over the world that actually face persecution, and that's something that can choke out yes. understanding too because it just, you just get crushed. And obviously yeah. I, can, I have a great deal of sympathy f- for persons like that. But then there's the other category that the affairs of the world, mm. especially for us in the United States, I mean, we're neck deep in the affairs of the world all the time, whether it's uh, the news cycle, which all it does is crank us up and kind of take our eyes off of, uh, of Jesus. So we just have to continually recognize that we have the ability to slide back into some of these other soils. So yes. you know, so part of it is um, I have a prayer life. One of my favorite places where is Jesus is um, um, doing all his miracles, and the, and, the, and the, you know, Jesus tells the person to believe, and the guy and the person says, "Lord, I, b- I believe. Help me with my unbelief." Mm. I think that's a powerful prayer for ourselves, you know, or even say a prayer like, uh, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's just come to Jesus yes. open handed, and invite you know, Jesus to change the soil in our hearts, which opens us up to understanding. So, I mean, I think we, we want everybody listening to know that um, this doesn't have to be a scary thing. Like, oh no, what if I'm in one of these bad soils? It's like, let's recognize, yeah, we can actually be in one of these soils, but that's right. that doesn't have to be the end. And the whole thing is come to Jesus. Jesus wants us to be good soil. And Jesus will teach us as long as we open ourselves up to that and then have the courage to move past the world, be courageous in the face of hardship, and then just make sure that our own hearts aren't hardened because of um, you know, some kind of sin or just being willful that I just don't want anything to do with that. I mean, so that, that, I think it's real important that it's intention. So I love that word that you used. Oh, I fully agree. And there's a statement in John seven seventeen that kind of sums up this point about willingness to follow, willingness to receive, being the prerequisite for understanding. It's John seven seventeen. If anyone desires to do his will, he will know. Dot, dot, dot. Notice the order. Desiring to do his will. Receptive to the truth. The promise then is you will know or you will understand. I think there's also an echo of Daniel 12 in this passage in this parable daniel 12 verse 10 many shall be purified made white and refined but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand there's a lot in the parallel passage in matthew 13 about understanding yes and so that's really what i want to zero in on i don't know if you've ever met people who have said this but I certainly have, and that's people who say, oh yeah, I read the Bible once. I know what's in it. The implication there is they read it one time, and that means they got it. Right. All right, I got the t-shirt, and now I've moved on to something else. Well, I can tell you this. If you read the Bible once, you're not going to understand it. (laughs) In fact, the scriptures are something that you want to read an entire lifetime, and even then you're not going to understand all of it. The mystery of the kingdom is the same way. And this is why Jesus, he didn't just use one parable. He used multiple parables. He talked about it constantly. And then he illustrated it through many different signs. And this gets back to one of the points I made. People often ask me, what what is the kingdom of God? Define it. Well, Jesus never defined it. He displayed it. He illustrated it. He demonstrated it. He told stories about it. (laughs) Because it is something that's so vast and encompassing that if you define, as soon as you define it, you've drained it from much of its power and the dramatic effect it's supposed to have. So, in effect, the secret of God's inbreaking dominion is given to the inner circle of Christ's followers. These parables are protecting the incognito of Jesus when he speaks in public, at least until the time came when he disclosed who exactly he was. So, yeah, it's so fascinating that it had the purpose of concealing the truth 
from those who were not ready to perceive what it actually meant. And it also reminds me of a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here again, you see this dichotomy between insiders, those who know the mystery, versus outsiders, particularly the rulers of this age, who had they known the mystery, they would not have killed Jesus. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. This is verse 10. Then he says, verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So, two big points there, Brian. One is that the natural man, the man who is in his flesh, who's following his carnal urges, is not going to be able to understand the secret of the kingdom. He may hear it with his physical ears, but he's not going to understand it because his heart is set on the flesh. The other point is that the spiritual man, as Paul calls him, the one who is walking in the spirit, which Jesus certainly was, cannot be understood by the natural man. And this is a perfect description of Jesus. People couldn't figure him out. He was constantly surprising them. He was constantly throwing them off. They just couldn't figure him out. He was a walking parable, right? He was a riddle. And those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, and he often said, let him who has ears to hear, hear. They were the ones, because of that soil, their hearts were receptive, their hearts were open. There was a certain humility there, which he outlines or emphasizes in some of the other parables. They were able to recognize that this person, Jesus, was someone different. You know, he wasn't just another prophet. He wasn't just another rabbi. There was something totally different about him where those who had hard hearts, their intention was set on the flesh. They didn't recognize him at all. And neither did they understand his teachings via the parables. Yeah, that Pauline passage is so good. Uh, you know, one of my all-time favorite verses is, uh, is what was it, one eighteen there in, in 1 Corinthians. one eighteen plays right into the, um, the, the which said in chapter 2, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the, the power of God, for it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will, will thwart. You know, it gets back to that paradox. So, you know, and when you th- we talks about Jews and um, in, in Greeks there, uh, that's everybody pretty much, right? And yeah. so, and in Jesus' day, so the folks that are watching him, they're missing it, um, mm. even though it's right in front of their eyes because it's back to expectations. You know, what's what's a holy person look like? Well, it's not, and, you know, this is my, the Messiah is going to be King David. It's going to free Jerusalem, going to bring in the kingdom of God, which, you know, that, that's language from the first century. But they're expecting that meaning the full reversal of all earthly kingdoms, specifically Rome that was oppressing them at the time. So it's like a liberation thing. And so here's Jesus. He's crucified. So the kingdom ultimately ends up being powerfully, dem- most powerfully demonstrated in the death and resurrection of Jesus and then the outpouring of the spirit at Pentecost. But if you're expecting liberation, you miss it. If you're Greek, you know, you have this incredible wisdom tradition. So you have uh, heroes like Socrates, you have, uh, um, you know, you have, uh, like Paul runs into an Acts 17, you have the Epicureans who have a way of life, you have the Stoics who have a way of life, you even have mystery religions, which is the same, you know, it's this mystery word where you people had these secret really mm-hmm. secret societies, kind of little mini cults within all the Roman stuff where people would get secrets that nobody else knew that would give yeah. them meaning. And then, and it's kind of interesting, you know, what's the secret of the kingdom? It's back to crucified God. That doesn't make any sense. And so it's yeah. foolishness. And so it's, it, it, you can just imagine the issue, you know, why do people not get it? It's because the, at some level, the kingdom is such a radical message mm-hmm. uh, that it, it's it's a paradox and it's a reversal of our own expectations because the final word is 
a person dying on a cross. And that, again, hmm. is both offensive and makes no sense, both to a Jewish sensibility coming out of the Old Testament with their expectations, nor does it make any sense in a Greek context because, I mean, the Romans crucified thousands of people, and that's no way, and that, that, that's the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So this is just, um, you know, powerful. Um, and so this, it takes, uh, you know, spiritual discernment is uh, opening ourselves up to really what almost runs counter to everything that basically any human culture teaches. And it's a call. Then you know that's why Jesus starts out. I mean, the, I think the beginning yeah. word of the kingdom. It's um. It's what is it? It's, it's repent and believe. Line up yourself with this incredible message of Jesus. Yeah. Um, did you ever like Michael Card, the, um, the, the the Christian singer? He has this old song about um, God's own fool. And part of the one of the choruses was believe the unbelievable, come be a fool as well. In mm. other words, that this this whole message of Jesus was uh, uh, it sounded like foolishness, even though it's it really is the good news. And this you know this whole parable of the sower, it's like uh, you hear the message like oh my gosh, this this sounds uh, almost too good to be true. And then like well, people are going their own way, but again, some Jesus, we don't get it. Tell us more, and then Jesus yes. opens it up to them. Tell us more. We don't get it. Yeah, that encapsulates the attitude um, when it comes to the message of the kingdom. Now, I want to reiterate something and add to it. In verse 33 of Mark 4, Mark says this, And with many such parables, he, Jesus, spoke the word to them, meaning the word of the kingdom. He spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Verse 34, But without a parable, he did not speak to them. Without a parable, he did not, without this coded language, he did not speak to the masses. And when they were alone, meaning his first followers, his disciples, he explained all things to his disciples. So the parables, in effect, become stepping stones for those who believe. But to those who rejected the message of John the Baptist, for example, those who had hearts that were closed to Jesus himself, the parables were stumbling blocks. So again, this gets back to the soil, whether or not the parable is going to be a veiled message <laughs> or something that you understand and brings you closer to the kingdom of God or further into it, it all depends on the soil, whether the parable is going to be a stepping stone or a stumbling block. Also, too, and I, I've said this in another podcast episode, but Jesus said to them, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all other parables? So there seems to be a foundational elementary principle within this particular parable that would then unlock all the other parables. And, and I think the way he interpreted this may give us a clue as to how to interpret some other parables. You know, he does talk about seed. He does talk about growth. Well, the gospel of the kingdom is something organic. You know, he uses seed to demonstrate. It's something living. It's something that if you receive it into your heart, it grows, right? Bears fruit. And then this business about the bird being Satan. He mentions birds in some other parables. So I do think that there's something to this parable that makes it unique and foundational to to other parables. Yeah. Yeah, it gives us the, um, it, it's an interpretive lens. I mean, this is the first parable in, uh, in in Mark. Matthew organizes a lot of Jesus's parables all together in chapter 13. This is that first parable. It's the longest. We have Jesus actually interpreting it. So we have kind of the model that Jesus gives. And it's a parable about receptivity. And, you know, mm. we've said this a couple times already, but the reason, the, the reason it explains the other parables and is sort of a paradigm if you will for the other parables is it's about response and, and you know and, and, and frank the scandal of the, the, all the gospels is this i mean we love jesus and there's all i mean there's literally i mean thousands of people are going to be listening to this podcast and so you know whoever's on here there's like a thousands of other people are hearing this if you can imagine being in the first century and you're some of the first christians and again these gospels come you know sometime after G they were written sometime after jesus was um crucified and risen and the spirits already come out but we're just talking about a handful of people actually get it mm -hmm. and so can you imagine in the first century you're hearing the gospel and you're thinking like well if this is such great news i'm looking around how come nobody knows about this yeah 
And then even in, go even back it up, how in the world, if this is such good news, how did Jesus even get crucified by people that should have known better at some level, right? And so the uh, part of the power that, of this, the ex explanation power is this essentially explains unbelief in mm -hmm. some level and belief. Mm -hmm. And this shouldn't scare our audience, um, but it's about, is the soul, again, is the soul in our own heart open mm -hmm. to what God wants to do in us? And that's, that's really the question. And as long as we're open, this parable becomes really good news because the, the, the stunning part of this parable is Sometimes we miss it. We tell me, like, geez, I don't want to be this other soil. But just think about the good soil again. It isn't just good soil. Like, oh, I got a couple of flowers or, you mm -hmm. know, I, have a, <laughs> I got a tomato plant. I got like three tomatoes on it. We're talking about, even though this is literally one fourth of the soil or, or whatever, it's 30, 60, 100 fold growth. So that's a picture of complete abundance. Because even 30-fold is huge. I mean, mm. put that in money terms. If you invested some kind of amount of money and you got a 30 times return, that's life-changing. Mm. And so we don't want to miss the point that this parable is encouraging folks that, the, 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 that regardless of how it looks at any given time, like there's all this bad soil, the kingdom's message is landing mm. where it needs to land. And it's going to do amazing work and so what's you know what's our role so mm. yeah i um i just love this phrase the secret of the kingdom yeah, the mystery yes. of the kingdom you know, paul picks this same concept up in his writings where he uses this word mystery or secret 21 times in his writings and in first corinthians 4 1 he says that we are stewards of the mystery stewards of the mystery of god or the mystery of the kingdom. We'll talk later in another episode about the kingdom being given to children. Yeah. And I think this really applies to what we're seeing here because it has to do with the attitude of the heart. Yeah. You know, Jesus said, I have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but I have revealed them unto babes, right? Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, not many wise, not many noble, not many powerful has the kingdom message been given, I'm paraphrasing, but it has been given to the weak and the small and the insignificant and the lowly. You know, again, getting back to this heart attitude in Isaiah says, who shall he teach wisdom? He's given it to those who are babes, to those who are nursing. You know, again, metaphorical language to describe the attitude of the heart. It's fascinating to me that he makes this statement, which I think is, is worth repeating in verse 24. Take heed how you hear. Yeah. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whosoever has, to him more will be given, and whosoever does not have, even that which he has will be taken away. It seems to me the message there is, whatever you put into this understanding of the kingdom message, that's what you're going to get out of it. If you apply yourself to what you hear, all right, or in, in the case if you're reading a book on the kingdom, an article on the kingdom, to the degree that you apply yourself, you pay attention and you put it into practice to that degree, you're going to receive more light, more insight, more grace from the Lord. But to the degree that you ignore it or take it for granted or kind of push it off to the side and then move on to other things, so to speak, even that which you have will be taken away. So this is a great exhortation to all of us. There are, uh, and I've said this before, but there are books that I will not just read once. I will read again and again. <laughs> Brian's looking at his book right now on the table and he's pointing to it. <laughs> and there are messages that I will listen to repeatedly because for well, whatever you have in the way of spiritual insight, understanding, the more you apply yourself to it, the more you will receive from the Lord. Absolutely. And the more you ignore and don't pay attention, right? Take heed, Jesus says over and over again. Let him who has an ear hear. 
pay attention. These are all words that Jesus said over and over again when it came to his ministry. Then whatever you have will be taken away. You know, it's a paradox, but therein lies the secret to understanding the kingdom and seeing it bear fruit in your life. Yeah, I found, you know, you mentioned the James before, but James talks about, you know, you don't want to be the person that it's like looking in the mirror and then forgetting what you look like. Mm. One of my favorite prayers when I read scripture and I try to teach all my students this is um, I pray, pray that God astonish. I pray that God astonishes me when I read the word. Lord, astonish me mm. anew, which the riches of your word. Because when you pray, you know, when you're looking to be astonished, mm. you, you want to hear. And, you know, that's, and, and, you know, that's, that's the good news. We have to come hungry. And, you know, in a sense, you might Amen. think of the, the parables, the way that Jesus tosses out parables. And this, and this is, again, we're, we're in this culture now where I understand that people have like three to five seconds of, um, of, of attention. If you don't get it, you lose them. Jesus was trying to make people hungry yes. for more. And so I would almost say, as we read the text, if, if you like think, oh my gosh, I don't think I understand it. I hope I'm not bad soil. But if in fact you're actually recognizing, you know what, I don't understand it. I'm hungry. I want more. Lord, astonish me. That's actually opening yourself up. And you know, as Jesus is going to say to somebody later, you're, you're not far from the kingdom at that point when, when you're open and hungry. and Because uh, Jesus promises to fill us. Yeah. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they, what, shall be filled. Amen. So the parables are really spiritual tests. They hide the truth from those whose hearts are not aligned with God, and they unveil the truth to those who seek, knock, press in to the Lord for understanding. I like what you said about the fact that all of us, we can slide through these different soils. You know, it's not just, I've always been a fourth soil guy and I will always be a fourth soil guy. Well, it doesn't work that way necessarily because while that's the ideal, the fact is all of us are vulnerable, yes. right? To get sidetracked by the cares of this life, which you mentioned the affairs of this world, by the deceitfulness of riches and by the desire for other things. This is why we have to have the kingdom message before us constantly. Amen. This is why we have this podcast, <laughs> to keep the word of the kingdom before us and to drive us deeper into it. Good. Amen. Amen. Mark just uses a little snippet uh, that he, he just, this is from Isaiah 6. And if, if listeners haven't looked at that, uh, the most famous part of probably Isaiah 6 is the beginning where Isaiah has this incredible encounter with God in the temple. It's basically Isaiah's call, call to ministry. Mm -hmm. He sees the Lord. He gets uh, transformed. There's just this incredible scene that he has this literally full orbed multi-sensory encounter with God. And then God of Famously in verse 8 says, um, who shall go for us? And uh, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And then God sends Isaiah with this commission to ministry that, again, sounds a little scary. Now, there's just a snippet in Mark. It says, um, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, may indeed listen but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. If um, we look at Matthew 13, you get a little bit more. And this is Matthew 13, 14 uh, to... 15, uh, with them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of the Isaiah, which says, you shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are heavy of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn for me to heal them. Now, it's interesting when, if you go back to Isaiah 6, um, Isaiah Lord says, Lord, how long? Because, like, you know, when you think about getting a call, I'm like, well, who wants to go speak if it sounds like nobody's going to listen to you? But the, the the reality of this is Isaiah was preached in a very difficult time. But even in, in Isaiah 6, um, the listeners may not know this, the very last verse of, of Isaiah 6 talks about um, the, the, the forest had been burned down and even the tree stumps have been burned. This is verse 13. So you know, Isaiah says the, the parts that's quoted in, in the parable of the sower really ends with verse 10. But then and then Isaiah says, how long, O Lord? And then God says, well, cities are going to lie waste, houses without people, the land's going to be desolate, and the Lord's going to send folks into exile, basically. That goes back to the Old Testament. But then interesting, verse 13 of Isaiah 6, and this gives some framing for what we're doing here. Um, 
verse 13 of Isaiah 6, even if a tenth part remain in it, it will burn again. So again, it's, there's going to be a judgment. It's going to burn. So now even the part of the forest that's burned down, that's going to be burned all over again. So like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it's felled. So it's like if you've ever removed a tree, that's, that they would have had to burn it in the ancient days because they didn't have stuff to dig it out with like we have today. So it's really picturing mm -hmm. um, just completely leveled tree but then the last phrase powerful the holy seed is its stump mm. and so this is actually even in isaiah's context this is important before we um, kind of unpack what's going on in the gospel this is a good news passage because it's basically saying to isaiah isaiah and isaiah's isaiah's about a hundred years before the exile he's he's preaching right and exile does happen but what god is saying even though there's going to be a season where people aren't receiving the message. Guess what? Even if it looks like there's no hope and everything's burned down, the holy seed's going to grow right back out of the stump. And, you know, Frank, you and I, we live in Florida, right? So it's you have this, um, uh, we have forest fires almost every year. And, like, you can go down, like, I-95 or I-75 or whatever, be along the highways, and they literally have, um, they'll have bushfires every year. And it's amazing. You can drive down the road and you can see where it's just all burned out. It's all black, but then the summer rains come and, you know, what happens? Um, it grows back. It's astonishing. It'll be black one month. You go back the next month after it's rained and there's all this abundance that's growing back up. And so this is actually a powerful message of hope. And so to bring it back to the parables, you know, does it sound like God means that, you know, I'm going to speak so nobody believes. And I'm intentionally hardening people's hearts and I'm making it impossible for a person to see here. No. Instead, what it's actually talking about is that if we aren't open to what God is saying in the message of the kingdom, we're basically bringing judgment on ourselves. So it's a warning is the way I, I would want to read that. It's not about God's heart, like, oh, I don't want them to mm -hmm. believe. It's more of an explanation. Again, in, in, in Jesus' day, it's really... In, in the gospel reflection, it's an explanation for how is it possible that so many people actually met Jesus face to face, the real flesh and blood Jesus, looking at Jesus just like I'm looking at you as we're talking, Frank, and they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's this text is kind of a um, it's an explanation to the faithful of why some people won't get the message. It's more of an explanation for how is it possible that the greatest message that's ever been spoken wasn't 100% received. F.F. Bruce, who I love, yeah. made the comment that there is a Hebrew tendency to express a consequence as though it were a purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, when he says, so that, Bruce is saying the purpose of the parable was not to keep people from the kingdom. It was actually a consequence. Certainly the parable veiled the truth for reasons that we gave before. The message is subversive. It's dangerous. You know, it wasn't the time for Jesus to unveil the fullness of what he was here to do when he started to present the parables. But the consequence, the way it works, is that if your heart is hard, it's not inclined toward the truth, it's not inclined toward God, then it is going to work in such a way where it unveils the message from your eyes. Yes. And the way that Bruce interprets or translates in paraphrase form what Isaiah is saying, what Jesus in effect was quoting, he puts it this way, go and deliver my message, but don't expect them to pay attention to it. The effect of your preaching will be their persistent refusal to accept what you say to the point where they will have rendered themselves incapable of accepting it. So that was to some people. Obviously, not all rejected the message. Jesus did have disciples. <laughs> he, he had the multitudes, but within the scope of the multitudes, he had a small number of, of disciples. And you said something before that I think some people may hear it and say, oh my goodness, that sounds like hardly anybody's saved. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus himself said, narrow is the way, few find it. Relatively few people in the Lord's day, really followed him. He had 12. You add the women, maybe being generous, we have 20. By the day of Pentecost, we got 120. 
Now, happily, that turned into thousands on the day of Pentecost and after, but still, it was not the majority of people who lived in Israel or Palestine mm-hmm. or even in the Gentile world who received yeah, the then, gospel of the kingdom. Yeah, Paul's having small communities that are able to meet. They're small enough they're meeting in houses, so it's just uh, collections of, like you like to say, kingdom cells, but it, we're just talking about a few... Uh, a, a relatively few number, even by the end of the first century, and then obviously the gospel continues to grow, yeah, and and so seeds, and so that that all plays into this reality when you're uh, feeling like you're an overwhelming minority. Isaiah's experience was in effect reproduced in Jesus' own ministry, but I want to kind of conclude this, Brian, and and give a couple takeaways, and then want to hear you uh, add to this and and give the listeners takeaways. Takeaway number one. If you are someone who's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and I know that we have listeners who are doing just that. We have people who are traveling, preaching the kingdom. We have pastors who are preaching the kingdom. We have, uh, we have missionaries who are preaching the kingdom. If you are preaching the kingdom, recognize that not everybody is going to receive it. One of the mysteries of the kingdom is that the kingdom is here, but not with irresistible power right? It's not like a wrecking ball that's going to defeat evil. It's not like a magnet that's going to draw every person. It's like someone scattering seed in the ground. (laughs) And some of it's going to fall on the highway, and some of it's going to fall on bad soil, and some of it's going to be picked up by birds, and then some of it's going to fall into soil wherein there's not a lot of root, And so in my own experience, when I have proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, there have been people who just didn't get it. They did not understand it. And they weren't interested in understanding it, you know. This is the foul bird coming and picking it up. They didn't say, tell me more. They didn't say, I want to understand this better. No questions. They just did not understand it. And therefore, it was a case of the first kind of soil. I preached the gospel of the kingdom before, and I saw some people receive it with joy, just absolutely out of their minds with excitement and exuberance. But then a little later, they fall away. And Jesus said they did not have root. Well, how do you have root? When you look at a plant, you see the manifestation of the plant above the ground. The root is what you don't see. And so the root is that hidden part of our lives where we are before the Lord spending time with him, absorbing his word, listening to ministry that comes from him through others, reading, seeking, knocking, pursuing. You know, that's where the root is. And again, if we just hear the kingdom and move on to other things, we're not going to have any roots. And it's not going to be long before we fall away and leave that message. The third kind of soil is those who receive it with joy. They understand it and they have some root, but then they get distracted and sidetracked by these other things. Attachment to money, which is a big deal in our society, or they're lusting other things outside of the kingdom of God, or they're being brought down by the cares of this life, which is huge. (laughs) But thankfully, and this is the work of God, Some will receive it and some will bear fruit. So I say to all of those who are preaching and teaching the kingdom, on the one hand, lower your expectations. Not everybody's going to receive it. Part of the mystery is that human beings can reject the kingdom. It does not come upon people whereby they can't resist it. They can certainly reject it. But take heart because there are those who are going to have that fourth kind of soil and will continue in the message, go deeper with it, continue to expose themselves to it, and allow it to work in their life so that they bear fruit for the kingdom of God, for the coming kingdom. The second takeaway I want to give to everybody is, let us all be diligent to and set our intention on becoming a fourth soil person where we seek and knock and continue to pursue and be open to learn. I wrote Insurgents a few years ago. I'm still learning about the kingdom of God. I'm still seeking. In preparation for these podcast episodes, Brian, where we're going through every single mention of the kingdom of God in the Gospels, I'm learning new things all the time. But I want to learn. 
And may the Lord extend grace to you to have that heart to learn and discover and apply and continue to walk into this glorious, explosive message of the kingdom of God. So those are my two takeaways from this uh, reference here in Mark 4. Yeah, and I'll just overlap and just four real quick things. I mean, this parable encourages all of us to persist in sowing. Like you said, apart from expectations, sowers sow. Hmm. Simultaneously, we can keep sowing because this teaching reminds us that we can be confident that there is good soil and it's going to grow. Those are the two positive pieces. And and then check your own heart so we can make sure, as you said, that we stay open and good for the soil. And then I I was going to end with almost exactly the way you said in in the scriptures. And Jesus um, promises us, uh, if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. And that's the one thing I want everyone to hear is um, this isn't a parable to try to say that you might be a person that God's decided is going to be bad soil now. No, Mm. it's if you like what you heard, seek, you'll find. Because God's already looking for you. Amen. And if you're listening to this podcast, there's an excellent chance that you are a fourth soil person, especially if you go on to the next one, because... Jesus has more to say about this issue of the gospel of the kingdom being like seed. Yes. Yeah. All right. Until next time, be good. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.